Hey folks, uh, today I'll be talking about museum data visualization with D3.js. It's a library that is commonly used for large data sets and to manipulate that data into all sorts of incredible uh, depictions. Uh, in particular, we'll be doing an example with the Metropolitan Museum of Arts database that's been posted recently on GitHub. Um, so in the past few months, years, uh, there's been a movement growing to, for uh, museums to publish their data open source on places like GitHub in particular. Some of the, the biggest ones on GitHub to date are the Met here in New York as well as MoMA, the Tate Modern in London, um, as well as the Cooper Hewitt and, and several others. Um, this presents uh, a great opportunity for museums to you know, uh, live up to their mission as uh, quoted by James Smithson upon bequesting his uh, donation to the Smithsonian uh, in 1829, you know, the increase and diffusion of knowledge and what better way than open source data. So uh, what to do with all this data? You have lots of it and where do you go? And that's where uh, D3 comes in, which is uh, D3 for 3Ds, uh, data-driven documents. Um, and as they say, it's all about efficient manipulation of documents based on data. Now, it's a, uh, a library that has uh, borrows some uh, similarities from jQuery. Uh, for example, uh, whereas in jQuery, you'd use a dollar sign. In D3, you use the D3 uh, symbol. Um, and what's really nice about D3 is that uh, they use the terms um, for graphical manipulation and uh, selection uh, from HTML, uh, CSS, and SVG, which we haven't used much, but that just stands for scalable uh, vector graphics, which is something you could use in HTML documents to create shapes um, and those sorts of things. Um, so here's just a, you know, a bare bones, very basic example of what D3 will look like. And it, it should seem relatively familiar based on things we've, you know, same ideas as jQuery, for example. Uh, so you have this D3.select body, which will select the body element in an HTML document. Um, and, and, and either if there are P's inside of it, or you know, paragraphs, or um, assuming the creation thereof with the data that it gives it, which is dot data, and you have this array, 4, 8, 15, and so on. Um, and what's really nice that D3 does is they offer this uh, dot enter and dot append that allows you to map for the amount of data you have to each new element. So you would get, and then dot text to attach the text to that uh, element. So you would get um, a body tag with uh, P for every, you know, I'm number four, I'm number eight, so on and so forth. So it's a very uh, simple method to use very powerfully with manipulating an HTML document. Um, and right, so the keys here uh, to think about are the dot enter um, and the dot data. Uh, now with that, I'm going to spend most of the rest of the lecture going through a demo. I put together a few cool uh, examples with the METS database in particular. So, um, okay, so I've made a few different examples. Uh, before I get into uh, the ones that use the METS database, uh, just a, another quick example. Uh, we have my index.html, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, these are the different uh, divs we'll be looking at, and then all my scripts for the different things. I have these two um, utility functions that you'll be seeing. I do a lot of different functions. Um, and, um, but yeah. So, yeah, perfect. So, the first thing we have is this uh, moving circles chart that I, I made. Um, as you can see here that we have the div and the index. It gives it a size. Uh, it, it uses this update function that I created that makes an array of random length within 10. Um, and then selecting all the circles within there and using th that SVG element circle uh, to create a circle for each one of those uh, pieces of the, uh, of the array. And with that, it, it randomly makes uh, one with a radius of a certain length and a position. Uh, now, positioning with D3, it all goes from the top left corner. So think about, you know, from that corner down. 
Um, and then the color, you know, you use this dot style to add uh, color, that sort of thing, and dot attribute to add other attributes to the, the text. Um, and then just a sort of basic set interval. And, and so, that, you know, something that's very simple has a pretty cool uh, uh, response, which is to get this generating every second box of circles. But now that has nothing to do with the data visualization with the METS database. And so now where this comes in is, uh, next we're going to be looking here at the, uh, some facts about the MET. Um, there's this really crucial component called uh, d3.csv, and there's also d3.json. And what that will do is uh, parse out an entire CSV file uh, and make an object, um, or an array of objects, I should say, one for every row of the CSV, um, where it'll be, let's say, the, the columns are name, date, age. You'll have name, thing, date, 2014 age, so on and so forth. Um, so it's like a basic object. So it's, it's really powerful. Um, and then within that, you could do whatever you like once you have that data as an array of objects. Uh, so here, for example, I have a few utility functions to find the oldest artifact in the collection. And we're dealing with a collection that's uh, over, I think, 450,000 uh, uh, strings long. So I, I mean, um, a ton of data that it's working with. Uh, but it parses all together, and then to this museum uh, class that we have on the index, it'll tell us that the oldest artifact is, you know, this one, and this example, the flake tool, that, and it pulls out the date. Uh, and, and, I mean, you can see the rest. You get the point. It's like the same thing. It looks at the, the uh, department to see the largest department, um, the age, uh, and then, just, you know, there's a medium column, and it turns out there's almost 4,000 that are attributed to being solid gold. So, um, right, so, so now we're starting to work with the database, but we want to see shapes, we want to see, you know, visual representations beyond just words. Uh, so this is a very straightforward one with that artifacts by year where I've made a very simple bar chart. Um, and each bar represents a year. We have this one very long year here. I haven't bothered with axes yet, uh, but we can assume based on our uh, string interpolation up here that that year probably represents 1899. Right, so um, once again, we're appending these li elements to a, a li an ordered list and just adding text to each of those. Very straightforward, very easy to work with. Okay. Now, uh, getting more a bit more complicated, no, I did not use Excel, though Excel probably would have taken me uh, much shorter time with the learning curve, but uh, same idea. We have a chart, um, and we're going to create a margin, uh, a width, a height, um, and then an x and y axes to control the length. Now, when you do that, um, you can set the range to that x and y uh, component. So. Uh, you can space out all your data accordingly rather than saying each uh, rectangle you see here will be of a certain width. You could say just spread them out based on how many rectangles we're, we're dealing with. Um, and then right, then we, we uh, access the, the chart which I have on the index with the class years and then make some attributes for width and height, uh, create a G element which is the typical element used in SVG and then you know, transform it so that the chart itself will be within the margins. And then once again, the d3.csv, this tool, I cannot emphasize how crucial and powerful this is. Once again, we look at a uh, CSV file that's 256 megabytes, huge data. And with that, we extract on it um, every, uh, the name of everyone, uh, or rather the number and, and the year. And then once we do that, we just uh, we, we map it out. We set a, a bar element with a rectangle. Um, and, oh, excuse me, not, right, uh, within the, de within the uh, department. Um, there we go. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, once we do that, we can, you know, edit the x-axis, you know, transform the anchors, do 
uh, various things like that. But it's pretty straightforward. Um, OK, so enough with bars. Now if we want to do a pie chart, similar concept, just using some different components. We have this uh, pie char chart here that will access the pie uh, uh, class that I have on the index. And then uh, from there, we set a radius and size of this pie element. Um, and then we, this is cool. So we create a color scale. And what a color scale will let us do is, whereas before we were setting these range bands for the rectangles to fit within a certain width, uh, this time we have it range across uh, you know, a light color and a dark color and range accordingly. And then with this arc that controls the, the size of the, the, uh, the pie with this path, we create uh, a full circle filled up by each of the elements. All right, and lastly, uh, what's interesting is, is this one was, uh, the, the countries was actually one of the easiest ones, I think, to make because it has this, uh, this, uh, this data map that you can import that gives you a map you can work with. Uh, you can control the coloring that you want on it. Um, and then you, this is just the pop-up template so that I have, you know, you can highlight a country and see how many artifacts there are there. And all this is saying is the number of artifacts per country attributed to that country within the Mets database. Uh, the darker the color, uh, the more uh, artifacts attributed to that country. Egypt, for those curious, has the most of 33,000 objects. Um, and so now just to close, I'd like to quickly show some other uh, examples that have been done with this. One moment. Here we go. So there's a really cool project done by this uh, data artist, Florian Krautley. Uh, and she took a look at the uh, Tate Modern's collection and noticed, uh, if you look here, uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's that giant bubble. And what this is, is all the artwork mapped over a period of time. That giant bubble in the center is attributed to this one British artist, J.M.W. Turner. And it turns out that in, I think it was the 1840s, they got, it, or they got a huge collection of his from around that time. Uh, so it sort of clouds out the data. And she saw, you could see in the pie chart on the left, 57% uh, of the art in the collection is attributed to him. So if you want to you know, then extract that from it, you can uh, do some really cool things with it. The, now this chart she did at the top is, um, again, over time, each bubble is a particular artist. Uh, from where they're born, the larger the bubble, um, the more artwork attributed to that artist. And then finally, on the right is uh, similar, but in this case, it's every artwork. Uh, individually, and you could see by time. And she noticed this anomaly in, uh, I think it was 1814, you could see that tall stripe. Uh, so she tried to look into um, what created that. And so she did this other cool extrapolation of the data where she also, she combined those two charts together and actually linked per artist uh, the artwork that they're attributed to. So you could get a really rich contextualization of the data that you're working with. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's a quick run through. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to check out the list. Uh, I have my GitHub up here with and everything's commented out, so feel free to take a look. And thank you.